Păi, plus plus este că există. Nu, orice program care, care finanțează educația este, după părerea mea, trebuie bine privit, bine primit, bine trebuie apreciat, deci nu, nu, nu văd ce ar putea să existe, să fie minus. Rest, astfel de mici lucruri ca birocrații, ca, eu știu, o perioadă de două luni, chestiile astea trebuie să uh, uh, reglate prin, uh, prin modul de, de aplicare, al, de implementare al, al programului. Și, pe de altă parte, cred eu că fie el și Erasmus, fie el deschis la toată lumea, cred că tocmai pentru a uh, avea o finalitate, adică a se duce pe piața muncii, cred că ar, ar trebui introduse niște reguli uh, care să, să, prin care să se intre în programul Erasmus pe baza unui studiu de piață. Se cer aceste uh, specialități, noi uh, finanțăm cu prioritate prin Erasmus aceste specialități pentru că se cer pe piața muncii. Bineînțeles că nu poți să expus pe toată lumea, dar trebuie să, să fie o astfel de regulă și atunci o să vedeți că cei care ies nu mai spun că nu mai au, -au loc de muncă. Se duc direct acolo unde e nevoie. Bun, vă mulțumesc foarte mult pentru participarea la discuție. Au fost aici, alături de mine, doamna Minodora Clivetti din partea Socialiștilor și Democraților Europeni, doamna Renate Weber din partea grupului ALDE, domnul Marian Jean Marinescu din partea Popularilor Europeni și din partea cetățenilor, domnul Liviu Hopătean, președintele Artis Casa de Cultură Belgo-Română și Oana Alexa, studentă, gazda dumneavoastră, Luana Pleșa. Dezbaterea Euronest Plus pe tema Studiul în străinătate, organizată de Radio România Internațional, partea societății Române de radiodifuziune, continuă imediat în limba engleză și va fi moderată de colegul meu, Brian McGuire. Numai bine, mulțumesc! Tot cu noi! Welcome to this Euronet Plus debate presented within the Citizens Corner concept. The debate is hosted by Radio Romania International, part of the Romanian Radio Broadcasting Corporation. Today we discuss the Erasmus Plus education program and the experiences of European students studying abroad. The debate can be followed live on our Euronet uh, Plus Inside website, on our Facebook profile as well as on Twitter. Users can comment, share, react and interact as some of you have been doing already. And joining us today is Slovakian MEP Katarina uh, Nevedelova, a member of the Socialists and Democrats in the European Parliament. Adam Tyson, head of unit for higher education and Erasmus and DG education and culture at the European Commission. Dimitri Fonea, a Romanian representative of the European Economic and Social Committee. And two Erasmus students, uh, Johanna Ernst from Germany. Uh, Johanna is studying at UTA Tampere in Finland and Alexa Oana from uh, Romania, currently with uh, Babespoia University and uh, UBB Radio Online. Welcome, all of you. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. So, uh, a lot of the questions we're already getting uh, online relate to uh, how uh, Erasmus uh, has changed, uh, this new Erasmus Plus uh, program. Adam, uh, let's start with you. Uh, what's in the new package which wasn't there before? 
Well, first of all, there's a lot more money involved. Um, thanks to the support of the European Parliament that we had during the negotiations, we have managed to increase the budget for the programme by 40% over the previous period. And that's extremely welcome for us. And it's going to enable us to do a lot more in the new programme than we did last time, not just in terms of the numbers of students that we can support, but also the types of activities that we can support. So we'll continue with the traditional credit mobility, which we're trying to make bigger and better, improving the quality of the uh, exchanges and, and the content of the, yeah. the exchanges, um, but also uh, creating a wider variety of possibilities. So for the first time within the Erasmus program, students will be able to go abroad, not just for a short period okay. during their studies, but for a full degree. Okay, excellent. I know our students have uh, some questions that they want to put to our panel. So, uh, Johanna, what, what have you got for us? Yeah, I think uh, so many people are studying, for example, in Germany, the number of students increased. And I think so many people also want to go abroad. Um, when I wanted to go abroad, I thought, okay, I can gain more experience. But I also thought about my CV, that it's maybe very good to go abroad. And I really want to know, what do you think? What are the biggest benefits to go abroad? And what kind of economic value do you see in this? Uh, Dimitri, you want to take that question? Yeah, thank you very much. Actually, we believe that Erasmus and the possibilities that gives to the young people to go abroad are very much related to the idea of the European Union. Mm -hmm. For example, in Romania, all the young people which are which had the possibility to go abroad, they came with a different mindset. A different mindset which accepted, uh, they made, uh, this different mindset made possible for the employers to use their abilities at the higher capacity. In fact, we, we learn a lot of things in the schools. We have a lot of matters, we, we, we learn mathematics, physics and so on. But what makes the difference is the communication capacities. And that's what uh, the employers are looking for. And I think that is the value added of the Erasmus. For other side, it's a matter of administrating better your own capacity. Being alone in the strange country, in the strange culture, you have the possibility to interact, to administrate your own budget, which is given throughout this program, to not depend on your family, and that is the first step in the full employability of the young people. That is our opinion. Katharina, it sounds a lot like being an MEP, really, doesn't it? Yeah, yeah, sure, sure. <laughs> <laughs> so you were involved in the, in the, the Erasmus Plus uh, negotiations as well and the, the preparation for this. Yes. Um, what did you want to get out of this for, for today's students and, and for future uh, employees? I can speak on behalf of our committee that uh, there was a common decision and common agreement that we want to get more money, of course, uh, and more people to participate in these mobilities. And uh, I'm very glad that together with the Commission, which is not very often happening, <laughs> but we are very glad to cooperate on this issue especially, uh, we gain much more money for Erasmus and more people could participate. Uh, only if we speak about Erasmus, uh, for the university students, it's, it's 2 million people. If you compare it to the previous uh, 26 years, it was 3 million people in total. Okay. So it's a big increase in number, which means that 2 million people only for Erasmus plus 2, other people for, uh, 2, 2 million other people for the different uh, other mobilities because this program is not only for university students, it's necessary to say, but it uh, combines seven other programs for uh, education. So all the people who would like to use the mobility in education could use this new, um, new program Erasmus plus. Plus, uh, we include it inside the uh, mobility and the program for the youth, youth for yes. young people. So the former Youth in Action program. So now also known from education and other experiences which people would like to gain in uh, cooperation with the other people from abroad uh, is now included in Erasmus+, plus, plus the new program for sport, which is very small, minor, but it's there. So very, very important for us uh, as the parliament was to increase these possibilities for the people because maybe a bit answer your question which you uh, posed a few minutes ago is what we see in um, as the good advantage to study abroad is to uh, to see that you are able to work in multinational environment you are able to work under the stress and pressure because it's not easy to study abroad in the other country plus very often uh, you have to study in a different language, which is also showing that you are able to do that. And for the future employee, employer, it can be a good advantage for the, the future person he can hire. 
So um, these are maybe the skills which we would like to, to give the people, plus European identity and understanding that we are in a common space, common environment, is something which is also the added value of all these programs. Because, okay, it's different if you take Erasmus for half a year or one year, or if you study abroad for, for your full degree. There is a difference between. But don't expect that Erasmus for half a year will give you some special knowledge which you wouldn't gain uh, in, in your school. It's more about these added values, this something plus, uh, which is additional, which we would like to provide the people with. So this is a, a deeper experience? Yes, much more. And it's all, all, all about this, so to understand the identity and you can go and study to change uh, and go to other, other, uh, other country and see that this is still European Union. So this is, from my understanding, the, the biggest advantage of Erasmus, to give the people the chance to see that uh, they are different but equal and all the same, in fact. Okay. Uh, I want to prepare uh, an audio clip we're going to listen to later, touching some of those themes. Why don't you have a question you want to put to the panel? Yes, uh, regarding the money. You know, um, I heard many students that told me there are some problems because they receive uh, the grant only after two months. So they have to spend all their economies in these two months. Do you think that this problem can be solved? Adam. That's a difficult question. And, and um, clearly there are different experiences that students have. Uh, from one country to another and of course it's the universities and colleges themselves which make the payments to the individual students and so it's very important that the international offices in the universities have the support that they need from their national agencies but also from the network of, of international officers so that they can carry out their work as efficiently as possible and make sure that those payments get to the, the students. Now you probably heard that last year we had some difficulties with the Erasmus budget because we didn't have enough payments to cover the requirements for the student grants. This year that looks like it's been solved um, and I hope that we're not going to find ourselves in that sort of situation again. But this is largely a political problem between the, the Parliament and the Council uh, and Member States uh, who are not willing to give us the money that we need uh, when we need it. And I hope that very much that we'll be able to, um, now that we have this agreement on Erasmus+, Plus, that we won't see the repetition of that problem in future. We are working with the national agencies to simplify the system of grants so that there is a more standardised procedure across the different countries. And I think that will also make it a lot easier for the universities and colleges to make their payments on time. Katharina. I would like to add just one thing, uh, which is concerning the money, because I'm, I'm glad that it was uh, the issue of the European Parliament that we would like to increase the grants for the students, which is a big issue, and um, I think that maybe you have the question also on that. Uh, we agreed that this money, those grants will be increased, but it depends on the countries, how they will administrate these issues. So it's not given, it's not for sure, but there is a special part of the, the legislature which says that we want them to increase the money and there is the ability for them to do that. So also the increase of the money of the total budget is also there to increase the grants for the students because we understand that especially coming from the eastern part of the European Union, it's very difficult to study in the western part of the Union because also the grants are different and also the living standard and the, the needs for the money are much more higher. So we would like them to, to do that, and there is the ability so they can do that. And it will be the recalculation of the grants. So the grants will be different um, according to the living standard? Yes, it should be based on the country which you are going to, not which you are going from. So it should be uh, validated in a way, but it's not 100% that it's starting in January. And also the procedure with, with the money, I would like to support Adam, what he said. It's um, the European fund, so it's not easy to administrate and it's no, not easy to give the students. The procedure takes some time and we are very sorry for that, but we are improving uh, this issue and it will be better, we hope. Uh, the Commission, I understand, uh, adjusts payments when its own staff go overseas, depending on the expense occurred in each country. How do you uh, think the, this program can be adjusted and how this problem can be solved better? Well, I think we are working already to try to solve this problem. As Katarina has said, we will um, fix the level of the grant depending on the difference between the sending country and the receiving country. Okay. So that someone going to a more expensive country will get a higher grant. And um, we will know early in the new year what the levels of the grants are going to be for each of the countries. And we'll be able to publish that so that people will know in advance what, um, what level of grant they'll have. This new system will come into force for all of the exchanges from 
the next academic year, so the 2014-2015 year, because the, the ones that continue in this academic year are still being paid for out of the existing programme, so the, ex the existing uh, okay. system applies. Okay. Johanna, you got another question? Mm, yes, uh, regarding to this topic. Um, of course, the money will increase, I know this, and but there's still a problem that the ECTS points I'm doing in my host university are not fixed with the ECTS point in my home university. For example, I'm doing 30 ECTS points at all, and my home university says, okay, you, we can only count 15 of this because um, it doesn't fit with our schedule. So I would like to know, of course, the system will be better, will be improved, but also the system regarding to the ECTS points. Uh, let's go to Dimitri first, then. I'm on the more general side of that, and then we'll come from a more technical side in a moment. Uh, you look at this as a uh, US and plus in terms of the federal uh, Europe approach to education. Um, do you expect to see a harmonization across for the, the, the credits? Actually, this can be the answer. A federal system of education, European federal system of education might be the answer. Many people look um, reserved when we speak about the Europe, United States of Europe. But will be a time when we have to discuss, because that is the solution to all this. This is the reason why we have so many differences in all, uh, all the countries. If I go from Romania to Spain, I will take, say, 625 euro. If I am Romanian, if I will be a German, maybe I will, I will take 1,000. So uh, these difference, differences are not acceptable in this new condition. When we have freedom of movement, freedom of, freedom of capital, what we are doing here? This is the things which are putting back our evolution. What's happening in the United States? What's happening in China? What's happening in Brazil? Big territories, a lot of people which are working under the same system. That is the main thing that we should do. And the Commission, the Parliament are here. European Economic and Social Committee always has supported the European idea. And I, th I think that is the solution for that. Mm -hmm. uh, okay, let's do a good time first thing, Katerina. Uh, Adam, you may not be able to discuss the United States of Europe. I might ruin a lot of people's Christmas over at the Commission. Um, but technically, how, how can this be a problem be solved? Well, the point of recognition of the studies that you have in, in, in the foreign country are, are is extremely important. And it's the, the very basis of the Erasmus programme. And it was Erasmus that created the ECTS system. And what we're trying to do now, because although in 75% of cases now, students have full recognition of the credits that they've earned abroad, there's still 25% who don't. Okay. And that's what we need to focus on. And so we're strengthening the learning agreements that the students will sign with their home university and their host university, which will make it clear that the studies that they're carrying out abroad will replace credits that they okay. should, have, should have studied for at home. So this sort of problem that, that, that we've just heard about should be a thing of the past. Okay. Okay, Catherine, just before we take a, a question from the public, uh, you want a final comment on that subject? Uh, well, I can maybe shortly say one issue that um, there is independence of the universities, which is a very difficult issue, very sensitive issue, and it should be in their own interest to cooperate, and if they want to have more Erasmus students, they must offer also more uh, better conditions for the students. So it also depends very much on the universities. It's not so much on the European level, on the Commission level, so we can have the best ideas on that issue. But if the universities don't want to do that, they won't. They will not do that. So, and also, there is, uh, I very much support the federal Europe. I'm federalist. But also, European um, Union. It takes time for us. It took time for the United States. It was 150 years until they united. So we cannot expect that it, it will happen like this in the European Union. So, uh, and there are different systems in the member states of the European Union. And education is under the subsidiarity principle. So it's a very difficult and very sensitive issue, which needs to be dealt very sensitive way. So to respect everybody, and especially also if, again, uh, we speak about the independence of education systems and the universities, it's very difficult sometimes to handle with them anything. So let's let's uh, wait a little bit on, mm -hmm. and work on that for sure. OK, thank you. So a uh, question from the public. Well, yes, speak okay. up. <laughs> well uh, we are talking about uh, the program, the improvements on the uh, Erasmus Plus program and the ECTS systems. But uh, what happens with uh, people that belongs to the previous studies plans in every country of the European Union. For example, in my case, I'm both a student uh, of a degree in history and geography and the ECTS plan, but I'm also a student of Hispanic philology with the previous plan. And how can we uh, get benefits from the new programs? Because sometimes we, we feel 
former students, we feel like we are like leftovers and all the new systems of education, but it's not fair and we don't have the information of how to ratify our students. It's just different of one year. Okay. And, well, yes, I really feel like I'm left over and I don't know how to participate in all this help that government gives to, to me, to, well, to new students. Okay, thank you for that. This is a subject which came up uh, on our Facebook page as well. A number of people, uh, not complaining, but saying it's, it's a complicated system, it's difficult to get through the formalities of it. Uh, Adam, can you respond to, to our question? I mean, obviously, it's very difficult to solve all of the problems of the past. And um, with the change in the types of degrees from what we call the pre-Bologna process degrees sure. now to the Bologna degrees, which are based on, on ECTS, there is a big change in many countries, and it makes it difficult to see the comparability between the two systems. Erasmus won't solve that problem, but what we are doing within the Bologna process is that we've set up a group of countries who are looking at ways to, to establish the automatic recognition of qualifications. Okay. So that um, we hope that by the next couple of years or so, we will have come up with uh, an agreed route and I can't say it's going to happen overnight, but okay. an agreed route to help the, the recognition of former degrees as well as the current ones. Time, timeline for that, more or less? Well, the ministers from the Bologna countries are meeting in April 2015, and I hope that they will agree there on the new way okay. of, of doing this. Katharina. Oh, um, it's again the same. Uh, it's very difficult when we change the pro process, and the Bologna is something which is taking a time. I'm happy that still more and more countries is applying, and still more and more, more, and more universities want to work on that. But it's also very difficult with technicalities, and uh, I have you have all my sympathies. Uh, but it's also about uh, again about the universities, how they want to cooperate, about the member states, how they want to cooperate, about the ministries of education of every single member state of European Union, how much they want to cooperate, and it's it's a puzzle, which needs to fit together, and then you have a clear picture, and then you have also the answer for your question. But it takes time. Sorry for that. <laughs> okay, Thank I want to get another question. Yes. I want to ask you if uh, is there a new communication strategy for Erasmus Plus because there are students um, who doesn't know about the uh, youth in action programs. Okay. Do you think that university um, should um, be uh, more uh, open to these kind of programs, not just for Erasmus because Erasmus is well known, but other youth uh, in action programs? Katarina. Um, it's a very good question. It's not only for the universities, but it's also for the journalists, for example, because many people still confuse, and this was one of the issues with the name for the European Parliament. If you say Erasmus and Erasmus+, Plus, people don't see the difference. So there is a new communication in a way that now we are in the process when the people who should uh, administrate this at the national levels are working together, are getting the information about the programs. And then it's the next phase, which will be for them to translate this to the people. So to have the actions, activities, promotions for the people to know what is this new program about because it has three pillars. Education, training, uh, then it's a youth, and then it's a sport. So to understand, first the people who should work with this new program because it's, it was signed last week, finally. This, these people should understand the program first and then they will translate for the people. But I think that should be a bit more communication about this because people should understand that Erasmus Plus is not only for the universities, but it's for everybody. And concerning Youth in Action, it's a program which is here for a couple of years. I guess I can say that it's very successful and uh, it's for young people and it's based for non-formal education, for volunteering, for example, activities, for youth organizations. So this is uh, the activities which should be supported from this one. As far as I know, I don't know which country are you from originally. Romania. Romania, okay. Uh, there are a lot of active organizations who use this program. It's a program specifically for young people, so there is no need for everybody to translate it, but to more support young people to know that there is this chance to get the money from this program. So I, I, I believe that these communicators at the national levels, the national institutions like the Ministry for Education or Ministry for Youth in national level will communicate much more that there are these opportunities for young people but we are not afraid that this will not happen or the people will okay. not understand it because it's still increase of the participants in all of these programs which is very important okay let's uh let's continue another question uh from facebook this is from magdalena zelozowski 
Uh, Magdalena asks, in times of economic crisis and high unemployment among young people, it is important to establish cooperation between the higher education sector and business. Is the Erasmus Plus uh, program uh, will it support such cooperation? Dimitro. Yes, we, we definitely we think Erasmus is uh, the case. We have the, um, already the testimonials of the people which benefited from this, and uh, we realized that was contact between the employers and the, um, the students, and also was a dialogue, uh, a social dialogue, we can say, okay. where the student organization, uh, employers organization, trade unions and universities has uh, communicated on this issue. The main issue is to clarify which are the requirements of the labor market, to understand in which kind of program we should involve more and to, to give priority. Because, of course, you can improve your communication skill. We clarify that. Uh, Erasmus is the case. But also will be good if also the professional skills will be improved throughout Erasmus. And that is the case where the business environment is very much interested to understand how this can help them. And the business environment, from what we understood, at least at the level of the European Economic and Social Committee, it's very much interested to be involved in this. They are in already in the Business Europe, our organization. I'm coming from unions. They are communicating with the Commission. Sometimes we make lobby at the Parliament. And that is our main goal, to establish this social dialogue and to determine how Erasmus can help concretely the business sector in order them to make uh, to be, how to say, attracted by the program. You know that beyond uh, these uh, programs, are, it's a lot of bureaucracy. And that is the main uh, point of concern from the students and from the business organization. Okay. I want to get Adam on this, and then I want to ask uh, our students' opinion as well, in terms of what they think they're going to get out of it. We're, Europe's investing an awful lot of money in this program, uh, and it's not just for the, the benefit of people going to visit other countries. What are we going to get out of this in terms of the, the long-term economic uh, benefit for Europe? I, mean, I think that the benefit is very clear um, from all this. I mean, the, the, the purpose of Erasmus is, of course, to help individuals, you know, whether they're in higher education or vocational training or adult education, whatever it might be, is to give them a new opportunity. The slogan of Erasmus is you know, changing lives and opening minds, and okay. that's what it's about. But when you look at that at, at a systemic level, what you see is that we are creating uh, a generation of young people who have a set of skills which is absolutely in demand in the labour market. We've just completed a study, we've carried out a survey with nearly a thousand employers across Europe asking them how they make their decisions about recruitment. And of course they're looking for professional skills, but they are also looking for the sorts of um, team, teamwork, communication skills, social skills that you get from participating in a mobility yes. experience. Um, and what they say above that is that they are looking especially for people who have had some sort of work experience uh, as part of their studies. And that's why we're increasing the proportion of young people who go on traineeships with Erasmus, both in the higher education okay. area and in vocational training, in order to give them that experience and to get them into the labor market much more quickly and easily. Okay, you had a do you see the benefit of this for the longer term, or is just the whole experience so big right now that you can't measure it? Um, I think, of course, I see the same benefits. But I also feel that there's a lot of pressure because um, the, co the companies really want us to see abroad. They want us to see that we're gaining international experience and sometimes it's not, not easy to do because not everybody has the opportunity to go because of the money. And of course, we, we are getting support from you. but. Um, all in all, I feel that there's a lot of pressure right now in our generation that we have to, to gain the international experience. So, yeah, that's my point of view. Oh, Anna. I think that the more important is to go outside, see how uh, things uh, are going, and then come coming back and uh, trying to spread it. Because um, a young... Um, has to um, find solutions for the new generations, and that's why um, the ideas that comes um, that, that come uh, from from abroad are important to be implemented in uh, uh, in the whole world. Katarina, the debate in Parliament when this was going through plenary was was pretty intense. Uh, I think it was one of the uh, the more intense uh, debates this year. Uh, the, there was a lot of hard feeling, and people. Uh, People weren't so sure about uh, investing more money in it, and others were really strongly insisting that uh, our youth deserve better. And uh, what, do you, what do you think the long-term benefit is for Europe's economy um, uh, from the Erasmus Plus program? 
First of all, there is not a lot of money in the program. It's 14.5 billion, billion uh, euros, which is, not, which is less than 2% of the European budget. So I don't think that it's very correct to say that it's a lot of money we are spending, and I dislike when my colleagues do that. But I can say that sometimes the people use these opportunities when it's in a plenary to use it for the national um, elections or national issues. But generally, I can say that even the people, uh, the people from all the European countries in the Committee for Education, which was, which was the, the main one for this uh, project and the program, uh, we had the agreement among everybody that this is a great program, we want, want much support, we want much, much more money inside, because this is a benefit for the people to see that we are really all in one, uh, one space, and everybody can benefit from this space the equal way, so everybody can go abroad and see that this is not abroad, it's not the other country, it's the, another part of the European Union. So uh, I think this is the most important part, and maybe uh, just a small point on the partnerships. The European Parliament is working on the university business dialogue for a long time. And this is something which we very much uh, support because only with the cooperation, in the cooperation with the labour market, we see that this is the added value which the people can gain. With employability comes opportunities. But on the other side, we cannot forget that there is this uh, dream job uh, in young people feeling uh, when they feel that they want to study something they like. In the current times, they should think about it much more. But also these programs like Erasmus Plus are not offering only the uh, better skills for jobs, but also non-formal education, which is much more important for the, for the future life. Like the part on uh, Youth in Action is promoting leadership skills, management, uh, exchange uh, of the views, best practice uh, exchange, and other things which are inside. And this program, once again, is not only for the university students, but is for the pupils in the primary schools, okay. for the secondary schools, for everybody, for lifelong learning, which is very important. So this common space, common environment for everybody who could participate if they want to exchange. Okay. Johanna, I, we spoke a little bit this earlier. I, why did you choose a European university, not, uh, not go to America, for example? I think uh, it's a point of the comfort zone. Because for me, I'm a German and I wanted to get to know first the European country because right now I feel more European, of course, after my um, internship, uh, after my semester abroad. And I think uh, the reason was that I really wanted to know the Europeans first before I'm going abroad to Canada, to America, and that was my reason to go there. Well. I think that studying in Europe can be the first uh, step because it's important to make uh, little steps in order to uh, know better what uh, you, will, uh, you will meet uh, when you may be studying in uh, America. So Europe uh, can be the first uh, experience. Okay, uh, we had uh, some here recently who said that one of the problems with a lot of the European countries' education system is that it was too vocationally focused and that it, uh, people were expected to go to university and the jobs just weren't there for them. But some other countries, which had much lower levels of youth unemployment, um, had a different approach. They, they uh, skilled people up straight out of school, didn't expect them necessarily to go to university, and they're looking at 8, 8.7% on youth unemployment compared to uh, you know, up to 50% in some other countries which have a, a higher cultural expectation for university. Um, what does Erasmus Plus uh, do to change this? How does it change the mentality? And what are we doing to communicate it? Well, I think that, first of all, it's very important that we shouldn't expect that every member state has the same proportion of its young people going into university because the needs of their economies are very different. So if you look at a country like Germany, which has a very strong industrial base, it's right that it should invest, invest very strongly in the sorts of vocational skills that are going to help it in, in developing on, on that side. Other countries which are more focused on service industries um, you know, may decide, yes. like Ireland, which has a, a target of 60% of its young people going into, yes. uh, uh, into university, may decide that you know, they need to invest in a different sort of skills and different level of skills. We shouldn't give the impression that you know, university studies good, vocational training bad, because that's not the reality. You know, we need to make absolutely clear to, to people that vocational skills are essential to the economy and they should be rewarded in just the same way and, and you know, valued in just the same way by the society. And the investment that in the new Erasmus Plus is giving to different types of education okay. is, is a sign of that. 
Okay, just before I ask uh, Dimitri for his response on this, if you want to contribute, go to our website, go to our Facebook profile and Twitter, and you comment and share and react in the last few minutes of the debate. Uh, Dimitri, what's your response to this? Uh, how, uh, how do we communicate this better? First, we have to understand that Erasmus program will not solve all the problems of the young people in Europe. To solve the problem, the real problem of the young people, we need to do complementary actions, and that is to have uh, a policy for job creation, an industrial policy in some cases. If we speak uh, in the Eastern European country where we lost our industrial basis uh, during the relocation and during the reforms and so on. Uh, so we need a lot of other complementary measures in order to make Erasmus more successful. Not the Erasmus is the problem. The Erasmus, from my point of view, is the solution. It's the partial solution now because we don't have money to finance more. If we want to finance more, we don't have this money. And we have to realize that we have to look on the real economy. That is creating jobs for young people. That is creating money for Erasmus, and everybody will be happy. So from my point of view, it's um, to not try to enter in this uh, discussion between uh, the UK position or Erasmus or Eastern European country position or Erasmus, that is, has no sense. That what is having sense, it's to build a European infrastructure of transport, European infrastructure of energy, a European infrastructure of, for education, to build something which is deserving all the European citizens. And Erasmus is just one of the programs which is doing this right now. If we speak something about education, the young people will say Erasmus. Other European program, we don't know at the same level as we know Erasmus. So it's already a brand, if we want or not. Okay, uh, let's ask the students. Do you have more confidence going into the job market, having done Erasmus? Yes, I think uh, that it can help us to, um, I don't know, to uh, see more, to uh, have an open-minded um, uh, view about uh, what uh, we will uh, we will face when we will uh, go to the labor market. So we are students now, but in two or three years, we will be uh, employed. employed, And um, I think it's a great experience. Johanna. For me as well, I think uh, since I've done this um, this program, I really know that I'm kind of German and I, that I have the German habits, of course, but I can also understand the other people and that, that I really have to look for other cultures and that I have to understand that we don't have the same culture, that we still have our other countries, but we are one big part together and uh, it's nice to see and I think it helped me a lot for the labor market. Katharina. Do we have more to do in terms of explaining the program, or do you think students get it already? Students get it already, <laughs> I think, um, because they, if they have the things which they can use, they can find a way, of course. But we have to spread the other information on Erasmus+, Plus, the new things which are inside. So we have to talk about it, talk about it, talk about it, and sure, assure the people that it's not only for the university students. This is the most important part. It's for everybody. Everybody can take the part of it. And I very much like what you said, because the freedom of labor force, uh, free freedom of movement of labor force inside the European Union is very important. And Erasmus Plus is something which is helping to understand this as well. So it's creating the common uh, environment for us. It's very important for us. Adam, this mobility of labor, is this critical to our, our youth employment strategy for Europe? Of course it is. Um, it's a question of making sure that young people have the opportunity to find the job which is best for them and which their skills best meet. And that may not be in their own town or their own region or their own country. So it gives that, that opportunity. We know that people who have done an Erasmus period abroad are much more likely to be mobile later on when they join the, the okay. labor force. And we're helping to create that flexibility and that, those opportunities for young people, but also for the European economy as a whole. And the language training as well. The, there's a new aspect to language training within the Erasmus Plus. Uh, Katarina, uh, do, you, do you think this will really make a difference? And for sure, we have 24 official languages of the European Union and uh, all of them are equal. This is very important, despite the fact that we use mainly three of them, uh, also in the parliament. But uh, 24 languages and language diversity is one of the uh, elements of the European Union and of our identity. Uh, we are united in uh, an inequality, but everybody is different. United in diversity is the logo of the European Union or the motto of the European Union. So this is a very important part of it, and I, I want everybody to understand it. Okay. Uh, Dimitro, anything else to add to this? 
regarding the languages, not always I'm scared about the fact that we have 27 languages in Europe. I would prefer to find out, finally, um, a lingua franca in Europe. It's necessary. The Romans, they had the Latin. We have to identify why. I don't know. Uh, we see what's happening worldwide and what are the languages which are requested by the employers and we have ourselves the, the, the answer. And we, we, would, we need to improve a lot in, the, in this regard to be a little bit more pragmatic on the fact. But in the rest, of course, every country has the, the right to defend their own country, their own language and their own culture. But the fact that you, we have a lingua franca in Europe, I, I think is not a bad uh, idea. Okay, it's not going to be Chinese though, is it? Uh, maybe, why not? <laughs> <laughs> let's see. So let's uh, summarize what we've been through this afternoon. Uh, there's a lot to offer for Europe's uh, youth now. And it's a difficult moment and the economy is starting to recover. Um, you seem to have a lot more confidence in, in uh, the employment uh, possibilities coming forward now as well. The language opportunities which the program offers uh, are much stronger than were there before. Uh, it's not just about university education any longer, it's uh, more vocational, more inclusive and uh, a lifelong lear learning approach as well which uh, Europe is, uh, is in need of as we get an older generation as well. So our mentality changes towards this. And uh, the money's there, 2% of the European Union budget going towards, that's, that's quite something. The Cameron was pretty upset about it, so it really must be something. And uh, the the level of uh, opportunity, we're going from, uh, we're now 2 million people taking this on, where was it 3 million over 26 years? It, that's a, a huge increase. Uh, and we have a sense from our students and, and uh, uh, from our, our political uh, team here as well that this is uh, a new sense of what Europe is in terms of, of education policy. So I'd like to thank you all for your participation this afternoon. Uh, Slovenia, Slovakian uh, MEP, Katarina Nevedelova, uh, Adam Tyson from the European Commission, uh, Dimitri Fonair from uh, ECOSOG, and uh, Johanna Ernst and Alexa Oana, uh, our students from Horizons. Thank you all very much for your time today. Thank, thank, you. thank you very thank much. You.